Welcome to Sparkle Storytime, family and friends. Today we'll be reading Habitat Survival Wetlands by Buffy Silverman. Wetlands. First, we'll, we'll go over the table of contents. What is a wetland? Life in a marsh, in a swamp, on a bog, at the ocean's edge, amazing mangroves, mangrove animals. Freshwater wetland food webs, saltwater web wetland food webs, wetlands in trouble, disappearing bogs and fins, protecting marshes and swamps, protecting coastal wetlands, glossary, find out more, and index. We'll begin with what is a wetland? A muskrat swims through shallow water looking for the cat cell plants roots to eat. A hungry alligator switches her tail and swims closer. Sensing danger, the muskrat disappears into a tunnel along the water's edge. Cattails, muskrat, and alligators live in the same habitat called a wetland. Soggy land. A wetland is a land that is wet. If you watch the ground during a rainstorm, you will see that rain soaks into spaces in the soil. When heavy rain falls, water puddles form on top. In a wetland, there is so much water that it fills all the spaces in soil. Then it floods the land. Muskrat eats eat cattails and crabs that they find in wetlands. A flock of snowy egrets feed at a coastal wetland. Wetlands form in places where land and water meet, such as the edges of rivers, lakes, and the ocean. Some wetlands have fresh water, while others are salty. Some wetlands are always underwater while others are wet only during certain seasons. There are wetlands all over the world, except in Antarctica. Did you know that? There are wetlands all over the world, except in Antarctica. Wetland homes. Wetlands are important habitats for many animals including alligators, turtles, and snakes. Migrating birds rest in wetlands. Fish lay their eggs in calm waters. Marshes are a type of wetland. They form along the edges of lakes and rivers. Cattails and grasses grow in shallow marsh water. Pond weeds float in deeper water. Few trees grow in marshes. In a marsh, water fill fills the soil, leaving no space for air. Marsh plant roots are adapted to grow in this waterlogged soil. 
some of them get the air they need from above. Cattails have air space spaces inside their stems. These air spaces make cattail stems strong and help them survive windstorms and floods. A marsh harrier flies over reeds as it hunts for food. River of Grass The Florida Everglades is one of the world's largest marshes. A shallow river flows slowly through huge sawgrass fields. Wading birds, sea turtles, crocodiles, and manatees live here. The Everglades is home to some animals and plants that are found nowhere else in the world. Land Builders The roots of marsh plants act like a net to trap dead leaves and stems. This detritus collects on plant roots. Detritus slow, slowly rots and becomes part of the soil. The new plants can grow in this rich soil. Animals come to feed and lay their eggs on the plants and the detritus. In a swamp, a swamp is a wetland where trees and shrubs grow. Swamps form where slow moving rivers and lakes flood the land. Swamp tr trees need air in their roots. But when the swamp floods there, there are no air spaces in the monkey soils. So cypress trees get air through knees that stick up like snorkels from the roots. In the trees, some swamp plants live high above ground. Air plants, such as Spanish moss and ferns, grow on top of trees. Their roots collect rain and dew from the air. Many animals live in swamp, fish, crayfish, tadpoles. Many animals live in a swamp and insects swim in swamp water. Forest animals such as deer and bears wade through swamps to find food. Great blue herons build nests in, in swamp trees. River otters have webbed feet and long bodies that are suited to slipping through the water. These are turtles. Turtles warm their bodies in the sun. Turtles warm their bodies in the sun. So here we have giant wetland. Brazil's Pantanal is the world's largest wetland. The Parque River flows through it. Low-lying forests and marshes flood in the ra rainy season. The Pantanal is home to thousands of plants and animals, including butterflies, monkeys, crocodiles, and macaws. On a bog, bogs form in cool, wet places. Thick mats of squishy sprogum moss grow over the brown water. In most habitats, bacteria break down dead plants and animals, but sphagnum moss holds a lot of water, leaving no space for air. Bacteria cannot fully break down dead matter in a waterlogged bog. When plants and animals die, 
In a bog, they pile up. The bottom of the pile turns to peat. Peat is soggy, dead matter. Bogs do not have the nutrients that plants need to survive. To survive, some bog plants trap and eat insects. Did you know that? Bogs do not have the nutrients that plants need to grow. To survive, some bog plants trap and eat insects. Flies fall into the leafy tubes of a pitcher plant and drown in rainwater that collects inside. Then the plant breaks down the insects. Insects drown in pitcher plants. Here are pitcher plants. These are pitcher plants. They eat insects. I'm sure there's a lot of flies for them to eat in a bog. Don't you think? Many bogs have open water in, in the center and floating moss around the edges. See the floating moss around all around the edge here of this picture of a bog. And we see the open water in the center. And here's moss. Bog animals. Larger animals also live in bogs. Otters and badgers eat birds, eggs, and chicks. In Ireland, red deer visit bogs to take a dip and get rid of flies. Bog men. Many dead people have been found in bogs because bodies do not rot there. One man found in a bog in Denmark died more than 2,000 years ago, but you can still see his hair, fingernails, and skin. At the ocean's edge, salt marshes form a long coast where land and sea meets. Twice a day, ocean tides rise, rise and fall. During high tide, water floods a marsh. When the tide goes out, there is dry land. The tides bring detritus or dead matter to a marsh. Detritus in the soil form a mud flat where grasses grow. Grass roots trap even more detritus, giving more plants more space to grow. Wave stoppers. Strong waves can hit salt marshes during storms, but the waves lose power as they wash across marshes. That stops them from harming coastlines. That's very interesting. The tide carries salty water and detritus to a salt marsh. Crabs pick up mud with their claws. They sift through it to find food. You see the crabs picking up mud looking for something tasty. Salt pumps. The tides bring salt water into salt marshes. So plants there are adapted to get rid of extra salt. For example, cord grass plants pump salt out of tiny holes in their leaves. 
tides wash away the dry salt crystals. Many animals live in tidal marshes. Fish lay their eggs in calm waters, then swim away. When the young fish hatch, they find plenty of food to eat. Crabs, snails, and worms burrow into mud and feed on detritus that washes over them. Amazing Mangroves Mangrove trees grow along the tropical coast. The habitat where they grow is called a mangrove swamp. During high tide, mangrove swamps are flooded with salty water. At low tide, the water disappears. Most kinds of trees cannot grow in wet, salty soil, but mangrove trees can. Mangrove swamps grow along coasts in the tropics. Salt barriers. Red mangrove roots filter water before they take it in. They keep salt out, but let water in. Black and white mangroves grow on higher ground. They take in salty water through their roots. Then they pump the salt out of their leaves. Floating seedling, seedlings. Red mangrove seeds start to grow while still attached to a tree. A long, thin seedling drops from the tree and floats in water. Its roots grow while it floats. The seedling can survive this way for a year. Finally, when it reaches a sunny, muddy spot, its roots grow down. Red mangroves look like they are walking on stilts. In fact, Native Americans called them walking trees. Their roots arch above water and some grow from branches. These spread out roots prop trees up in muddy waters. Red mangroves get air through roots above, above the water. See their roots? It's almost like they are walking. Isn't that amazing? Mangrove animals. Many different animals live among mangrove roots. The roots protect them from high winds and waves. They also trap dead leaves brought by the tides. After bacteria and fungi break this detritus down, the fish, shrimp, and crabs eat it. Snails, barnacles, jellyfish, and sponges also find shelter in mangrove fruits. Horseshoe crabs feed on many of these smaller animals. Saltwater crocodiles hunt water buffalo in African mangrove swamps. See the saltwater crocodile? They hunt water buffalo in Africa, man, African mangrove swamps. Mangrove swamps stop huge waves during a storm. This storm is taking place over coastal mangroves in Belize.
fish nursery, many fish lay their eggs among mangrove roots. The shallow water and tangled roots keep large predators away, so small fish can grow in safety. Fishing cats hunt in Asian mangrove swamps. A fishing cat taps the water surface with its paws, making ripples. Fish swim over, believing the ripples are from insects. Then the cat dives in and catches its dinner. Tsunami Stopper Mangroves protect land from huge tidal waves called tsunamis. When a big wave hits mangrove roots, it slows it down. Most of the wave's energy is lost before it reaches land. Can you imagine a cat tapping a water surface with its paw? making ripples and then diving in to get a fish for his dinner very neat freshwater wetland food webs plants and animals in a wetland need each other to survive they are connected by the flow of energy all living things need energy to live and grow. They get energy from food. A food web shows how energy flows from one living thing to another. Most food chains start with plants. Plants can use the sun's energy to make their own food. Freshwater wetland plants such as reeds and algae make their own food in this way some animals get energy by eating plants for example water voles eat reeds snails and tadpoles eat algae reeds water voles and marsh hares are connected by the flow of energy in this food web well let's take a look at a food web okay let's start here we have reeds water rolls and marsh terriers so we see here a water vole eats reeds and then a harrier eats the vole hmm. okay the tadpole eats the algae the snail eats the algae Mm -hmm. And the tadpole eats the dragonfly. Okay. And the energy flows through them all. Snails and tadpoles eat the algae. See the algae? See the snail? The water rolls eat the reeds. Very interesting. Water voles 
dig burrows in stream banks. They also weave ball-shaped nests on reed beds. Predators. Predators are animals that get their energy by eating other animals. Young dragonflies live underwater and catch pond snails. Marsh harriers eat. They catch dragonflies and water voles. All living things die, but their bodies still contain energy. Bacteria and fungi use, use that energy by breaking down dead plants and animals. This detritus feeds many wetland animals. Shooting jaws. A dragonfly's note's lower jaw is hinged. It folds up under its head. The jaw shoots out to capture prey. Saltwater wetland food webs. Plants and animals in a saltwater habitat also depend on each other. Thick strands of cordgrass grow in a salt marsh. Cordgrass uses the sun's energy to make food in its leaf blades. It uses the energy to live and grow seeds. This food web shows how energy flows through a salt marsh. This is how energy flows through a salt, a salt marsh. The striped bass and the moocha chalk eat the worm. The raccoon eats the striped bass. The green heron eats the crab. And all of these animals, when they die, and the plants will actually turn into detritus. And so it just repeats itself. And the energy is used to live and grow plants and also to feed animals. Amazing. Cuddle dining. Fiddler crabs feed on detritus, algae, and bacteria, but they don't like the sand and other bits that stick to detritus. They wash their food in puddles to separ separate the good parts from the bad. Detritus eaters. Few animals eat cord grass when it's alive but many animals eat it after it dies. Bacteria, fungi, and other tiny organisms live on dead cordgrass. They turn it into detritus, crabs, shrimps, worms, and growing insects feed on detritus. Small, crab, small fish called mummy chucks eat detritus, but they also eat shrimps, shrimp and worms. Striped bass eat the mimechogs and other small fish, as well as crabs. Raccoons catch crabs and fish. This raccoon wades in a salt marsh to catch crayfish. See him eating the crayfish? Interesting. Wetlands. Our wetlands are in trouble. Wetlands around the world are in trouble. More than half of the world's wetlands have disappeared in the past 100 years. People change wetlands in many ways. They drain wetlands to grow food. They build dams that change water flow and dig channels to control floods. Many cities now stand on land that used to be wetland. When water with chemicals from farms and factories reaches wetlands, 
it can harm plants and animals. The chemicals make water unsafe for people too. Wetlands are drained to make room for houses. In this picture we see the wetlands being drained in that area for homes. This woman is planting mangrove seedlings to help restore a habitat near her village. Mangrove decline. People sometimes think of swamps as smelly, useless places. Mangrove swamps are one of the tropical habitats most in danger. Half of the mangrove swamps in many Asian countries have disappeared. People clear mangroves to make room for farms, cities, and harbors. Saving swamps. Many people realize that mangrove swamps help people, humans, by protecting land from storms. The mangroves are also important habitats for birds, fish, and other animals. Governments have passed laws to protect mangroves. Groups work to keep these habitats safe. Disappearing bogs and fiends. Peat can be burned to heat homes or added to garden soil to help plants grow. For thousands of years, people have dug peat from bogs. But peat takes a long time to form. If we dig too much, too quickly, the bog doesn't have time to recover. Some bogs have been drained so that the land can be used for other purposes. Some Irish bogs are getting a second chance. People are removing drains and taking out trees and other plants. Then, bogs can grow again. Bogs of peat are harvested from an Irish... Blocks of peat are harvested from an Irish bog. The Great Fen. A fen is a low-lying wetland. Some English farmlands are being returned to fens. Many groups are working to restore a large fen. The, the planned fen will join two nature reserves. People plan to expand a small fen in England. Fens into farms. Fens once covered a large area of eastern England. The freshwater and salt marshes that made up fiends also flooded so only higher areas could be farmed. People fished and hunted in fiends. Many Then many years ago, people began draining the fiends. Once the land no longer flooded, it could be farmed. Protecting marshes and swamps. Around the world, people are concerned about wetlands. They know the animals need wetland habitats. Marshes and swamps provide food, shelter, and a place for young animals to grow. To protect animals, we must protect their habitats. The rare Cuban crocodile lives in Zapata Swamp in Cuba. The swamp is one of the largest wetlands remaining in the Caribbean. It is also the largest protected area in Cuba. Scientists are studying the crocodile and its habitat. They want to make sure the crocodile survives. People, animals, and plants benefit when wetlands are protected.
fast, guys. We're learning so much. We're learning a lot about the wetlands. Monkeys and more. Tanjung Pudding National Park in Indonesia is home to rare plants and animals. The park protects peat, swamps, forests, mangrove forests, and other wetlands, and also protects many rare animals. Orangutans, proboscis monkeys, butterflies, and water birds live in the park. Wetlands can help people too. They slow floodwaters, saving people's lives and property. Wetlands clean pop, um, pollutants from water. They give us a place to hike, canoe, and watch wildlife. Governments in many countries pass laws to protect wetlands. Laws can stop people from draining more wetlands. They help save the wetlands that remain. Protecting coastal wetlands. Tidal marshes all over the world are disappearing, but many people are trying to bring them back. For example, the Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge in Maryland has been losing marshland for years. Scientists have a plan to restore the tidal marshes by digging up dirt and detritus from river bottoms. They pump the detritus into water, into washed out marshes, and plant marsh grass in the muck. As the grasses die, detritus piles up and enriches the soil, so more plants can grow. Animals also come to eat the detritus. All of us can help protect wetlands by keeping them clean. Scientists are not the only ones saving wetlands. Kids in Louisiana care for wetlands too. A Louisiana teacher started Wetland Watchers in 1998. Students and wetland watchers adopted 28 acres of tidal wetland. Thousands of students have learned about wetlands while helping to care for them. The students remove trash and plant trees. They test the water to see if it's clean. They also build a nature trail that visitors enjoy. You can help wetlands. Find out more about them. You can read books and research websites. You can visit wetlands near your home to learn about the plants and animals that live there. You can also join a conversation group that protects wetland species and be energy wise to help reduce global warming. You can also tell your friends and family so they can help too. Thank you for watching.